generally useful in, in all sorts of areas. Yeah. Whereas your the stuff that gets the press now it tends to be, as I understand, much more narrowly focused. Yeah. And you have um you have also these rules and regulations that make it very inaccessible. You know, unless, you know, they, they make the data. So there's a propriety period usually for these big telescopes uh. that only the person or the PI of the program and the collaborators have access to it until a certain period mm-hmm. when it becomes public. Yeah. So that's why we, um, we appreciate um, like amateur astronomer um, community for that. Yeah. No, perfect. That's good to hear. I have run out of stuff to ask you. Uh, so, <laughs> is there anything you would like to draw people's attention to or projects you'd like to plug or share content yeah. with us? Yeah, sure. Um, so, um, I will promote uh, SAO. So, mm-hmm. you can visit, get information on SAO and what you can do, how you can visit uh, on the website. It's www.saao. Dot .ac.za. Dot okay. So this is, you know, for everyone, kids, adults, anyone interested in astronomy. There's regular, as I said, open nights that are held every second Saturday where the format, it starts at 8 and it's free and it's accessible to everyone. So the format is that usually there's an astronomer giving a talk for, you know, about 30 minutes or so. And then afterwards, if the sky is clear, we take out small telescopes, and you can also use the big telescope over here mm-hmm. to, um, to view whatever's up, whatever cool objects are, and mm-hmm. interact with astronomers and ask questions. And, and yeah, and it's free. You can bring any, any it, it's accessible for all age ranges. So typically you'll get kids from the age of four attending to people from the age of about the age of 80 or so. Wow, okay. So it's very it's a it's a wide it's you know, it's a wide range of, of uh people with different backgrounds. Some of them don't know anything about astronomy, some of them can can see that there's an interest there. Yeah. If people would like to talk to you, how can they get a hold of you? Um you can get a hold of me via email. So my email address is I Monacheng, that's I M O N A G E N G at Gmail dot com. Okay. Or you can just follow me on social media. Search for me on Facebook. It's Itu Meleng M Monacheng. Mm-hmm. And my Twitter handle is I am Matuba. So I am M A T U B A. Great. And I'll put links to that on the, on the show notes page. Sure. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ellen. Great having you on. A few episodes ago, when we last picked up our story about the evolution of a star from gas cloud to supernova, we finished on a list of the different types of star that you get, based on how much mass went into them. We covered brown dwarfs, red dwarfs, yellow dwarfs, and the various colored giants. But one thing all true stars have in common is that for the bulk of their lives, they are powered by the fusion of hydrogen into helium in their cores. Now, some stars are enormous and have enormous fuel reserves, while others are quite small and have significantly less. Now, I think that if you asked most people which of these stars would last longer, they'd say that the ones with the biggest reserves could keep burning for longer because, well, that's how reserves work. But stars don't just store their fuel. It's the very mass of that fuel which powers the engine, which heats and crushes everything together and causes the nuclear fusion to begin in the first place. So the bigger your fuel supply, the heavier it is, which means the core of a big star is much hotter and denser and larger than the core of a small star. And a bigger, hotter, denser core burns through its fuel much faster than a smaller, lighter one. This means that the biggest stars have very short lives, while the smallest ones could burn for many trillions of years. So what happens when that fuel does eventually run out? In a small red dwarf star, when it does eventually manage to use up all that fuel, fusion reactions just stop. Red dwarfs have convection currents so that fresh hydrogen from the outer reaches can circulate into the core and the helium ash can move away so that the hydrogen and helium stay pretty well mixed throughout the body of the star. Over time, the concentration of helium increases and the concentration of hydrogen decreases. As this happens, fewer and fewer of the collisions between atomic nuclei are between two hydrogens, and more of them involve helium. So we get fewer fusion reactions happening, which means less energy being produced, which means the pressure begins to fall. That 
allows gravity to win a bit. Everything can settle down a bit further until the pressure and temperature get forced back up enough to speed up the fusion again and the balance is restored. In other words, as a red dwarf ages, it shrinks and heats gradually. Eventually, though, it will reach a point where it just cannot sustain the contraction. It's just not heavy enough. And when that happens, fusion gradually dies down and eventually stops. And what's left is a white dwarf. A tiny, compact ball of super-dense helium, glowing white hot with residual heat. Larger stars, like our one, are big enough to push past this point. The first difference is that the core of a yellow dwarf star does not mix with the rest of the star. So despite having a much larger supply of hydrogen fuel, only a small portion of it is ever available to burn. And the helium ash does not get circulated away. Instead, it accumulates. And over time, the core eventually becomes almost entirely composed of just helium. But hydrogen fusion doesn't stop. Like the red dwarf, as fusion reactions slow down, the entire star contracts slightly, raising the temperature and pressure throughout, and so the central parts of the star that are hot enough for hydrogen fusion grow. So we end up with a hot, dense, but not actually burning core of helium, surrounded by an outer core of fusing hydrogen. Over time, the helium core gets bigger, and the outer core grows outwards into a shell of hydrogen fusion. Now from the outside, nothing seems to have changed much. The star's a little dimmer and a little smaller, but there's all this extra activity going on in the interior. A helium core slowly growing and getting hotter and hotter. And since there's no fusion going on there, no energy being released to counteract gravity, it also continues compacting tighter and tighter. At the same time, because the fusion of hydrogen is happening closer to the surface, the bulk of the star, all that hot plasma surrounding the hydrogen fusion shell, gets hotter too. In accordance with the gas laws that I've talked so much about, they respond to the increase in temperature by expanding. The entire star grows, getting bigger and bigger. As it gets bigger, the surface area obviously increases, which means it can radiate heat out more efficiently. More efficient radiating leads to two apparently paradoxical changes. The surface of the star cools down because the same amount of energy is now spread out over a much larger area, And the star becomes brighter because, again, there's so much more surface to radiate. Eventually, the core temperature is so high that something over 100 million kelvins, or degrees Celsius, that the next stage begins. Helium starts to fuse into heavier elements, like carbon. These reactions, involving three helium-4 atoms combining in different ways to produce different elements, are very temperature-sensitive. Increasing the temperature by even a small amount makes the reactions much more likely to occur, and this leads to a chain reaction within the, within the heart of the star. The helium core finally gets hot enough for helium fusion to begin, which releases energy, causing the temperature to go up a bit more. That causes helium fusion to happen faster, which pushes the temperature up higher, which speeds up the reactions further. So where hydrogen fusion was a relatively gentle and stable event, the ignition of helium is more like an explosion. Uh, that we call a helium flash. For a few seconds, the core is so hot and energetic that it produces about 100 billion times more energy than before. All this extra heat causes the core to rapidly expand, pushing back violently against gravity. Anyway, after all of this, things stabilize once more. We now have a large helium-burning core surrounded by a hydrogen-burning shell, and outside of that, our old radiative zone continues as if nothing had happened, and our convective outer layer after that. Incidentally, stars at this stage have ballooned up so much that all that violence of the helium flash, that explosive growth of the core, is completely invisible from the outside. These stars, incidentally, are called red giants. They are cool enough to be merely glowing red hot instead of that yellow, white, or blue heat that we've seen so far. And they're many hundreds of times larger than they were in their hydrogen-burning phase. The sun, for example, when it reaches this stage will likely be big enough to completely engulf the Earth. It will have grown from a diameter of a little over a million kilometers to well over a hundred million. This leaves so much material between the surface and the core that none of the violent activity is visible on the surface at all. Instead, we just see the star continue to expand as all that newly released energy heats up the outer layers and causes them to continue expanding even further. Now, as you'll remember from the very first part of the series, the further you get from the center of mass of any, of any massive volume, the weaker its gravitational hold on you. So as the outer layer of gas expands, it eventually reaches a point where it can overcome the gravity and simply lift off, escaping from the star, continuing to rush into space at whatever speed it had been moving before in an ever-expanding shell, spreading out forever, glowing, 
until it dissipates entirely into interstellar space. Meanwhile, with all that excess energy of the helium flash having now been released, the remainder of the star settles down into a new stable state, a hot, dense core furiously burning helium into carbon, oxygen and nitrogen at temperatures of over 100 million degrees Celsius, surrounded by a cooler shell of hydrogen fusion, surrounded again by progressively cooler layers of seething plasma. This helium-burning red giant stage lasts a significantly shorter time than the main sequence hydrogen-burning stage, perhaps 100 million years or so, less than 1% of the star's total life. And what happens then? Well, as always, that depends on just how much material is contained within the star and how massive it is. Our sun, having passed this stage, will eventually end as a white dwarf. But a star significantly more massive than that? Well... Now the end of our story is in sight, because this is when we get a mysterious neutron star, or even, if there's enough mass, a black hole. And we'll explain that next time. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, all three engines up and burning, 2, 1, 0, and liftoff of the Urban Astronomer Mission Update. Hi, and welcome to the Mission Update segment of the Urban Astronomer podcast. My name is Klamanga, and I'm your host in this part of the show, which will keep you up to date with current space missions, upcoming launches, and other space-related things I find interesting. And um, we don't even really have started our first uh, show, and we already have to celebrate. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Oh, that was nice. And um, yeah, that was 60 candles that were blown out there in the end. And uh, for no one else than NASA. And uh, NASA is turning 60 this week and can look back on a amazing history of manned and unmanned space flight and of course the first moon landing springs to mind uh, that will have um, next year its uh, 50th anniversary and uh, but also other milestone missions such as Voyager 1 and 2, Cassini and the Mars rovers to name a few um, have given us amazing new knowledge of the solar system and um, well it's also uh, a moment where we should remember that um, space flight um, is a pretty dangerous business and we must remember astronauts of Apollo 1, Challenger and uh, Columbia. And um, this year NASA is set to commence uh, manned missions with the commercial crew program and um, a return on the, to the moon has just been announced by um, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine at the AAU conference in Germany. So uh, all in all, that's good news. Well done, NASA. Happy birthday. Happy 60th. And uh, let's see what the next 60 years will bring us. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, moving on, let's talk about some space missions which are currently underway. And uh, if you've listened to the Equinox podcast of the show, you perhaps remember the Hayabusa 2 mission to asteroid Ryugu by the Japanese space agency JAXA. Um, at the time of the recording of this mission update, a third lander called Mascot, which is built by Germany and France, is floating down to the surface of the asteroid. And that follows the successful touchdown of um, the two Minerva rovers 1A and 1B several days earlier, late September. And uh, so far, ro the rovers and orbiter cameras show that uh, the surface of the asteroid is fairly rugged. And that actually may have some consequences for the acquisition of... Um, a regular sample by the orbiter a little bit later in the mission so we have to watch this what's going on there and uh, we'll report back to you once we know more 2018 is certainly the year of the near-earth asteroid missions and the second mission to go to an asteroid is uh, of course NASA's OSIRIS-REx, which will arrive at its target asteroid 
1999 RQ36, or better known as Bennu on the 3rd of December this year.